Welcome to another episode of The Swiss Show. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Tuckwood. Um, today is all about sales, sales, and more sales. Uh, my guest is joining us from Sydney, but it doesn't sound like he's from Sydney. Um, he was born here in Australia, moved to awesome. Canada, I believe, as a kid. Um, hey, you've done your to, research. To move back here at 19 years old to join the military, I think. Um, yeah, that's correct. A bit of a, or, or a fair best uh, stint in the fitness industry and, and is now in the sales coaching game. Um, his business, Sales Sniper, have recently started supporting us here at Swish um, and is a sales agency specializing in done for you, high ticket sales, sales system building and sales training. Um, they are the top done for you sales agency with an average monthly revenue of $1.5 million sold. Um, let's get to it. Mr. Matt Ryder, welcome to the Swiss show. How are you, sir? That's not correct. It's $1.5 million commissions. commissions. We, do about 20, we do about $25 million sold each month. Oh, what a nightmare. Right. I'm so sure we can I'll just, I'll, I'll raise it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. Awesome, mate. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Um, I do do appreciate it. I know, um, I know you're pretty busy as well, but, um, for somebody that is juggling a lot of balls, spinning, spinning a lot of plates or from the outside, I would assume. So you never seem too flustered. Um, you, are you just yeah, always like this? <laughs> uh, no, I, I definitely get stressed. Like I, I, I tend to internalize my stress though, because, um, but also like I have a pretty good, I think I have a pretty good, like, um, like a way of kind of contextualizing stress to where it doesn't bother me too much. Like I hired one of my best friends. I was in special operations, like like in like 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 in the military. I'll just step back a little bit. I was in special operations. And so like, you know, whenever I'm stressed or having a bad day, I'm like, did anyone try and kill me today? No. Okay. Well it wasn't too bad then. And like <laughs> I just brought on one of my best friends from my military days. We used to be in snipers together. And when I brought him on, I was like, hey man. Like, cause he just came out of the military to come here. And I was like, you can just take it down a notch, right? Because there's nothing we do here that can't wait till tomorrow. There's nothing we do here that can't wait till Monday. Like if it's on a Saturday, because like, we're not winning wars anymore. What we do is important, but it's, it's not grand scheme huge. So let's like, let's not lose our souls in doing this. And let's just enjoy ourselves and, Realize that, hey, man, if there's something wrong and it's five o'clock and you want to go home to your children, your children are far more important than a small issue that you're probably making into something bigger, mm. you know? Yeah. I think the more confident I get in my skills as well, the more, the less stressed I am about stuff. Yeah. 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 Per, per, uh, and we're going to get into it ironically <laughs> later on is um, perspective. And, and you talk a lot about perspective in, in your sales interactions from what I've seen and what I've heard. So um, maybe that comes from the foundations that you've got and the experience that you have from a life, um, a, <laughs> from life experience. So put it into context for us then for people that don't know who you are, um, just give us the, the quick overview of how you ended up being, uh, being over here, going back there, coming back here, joining the army, saving the world. Yeah, well, my dad was like a kind of like an inventor boffin type guy who got kind of carted around. So we just kind of followed him around the world when I was a kid. Went to 11 different schools um, growing up. Uh, lived in like, man, like, you know, probably 15 houses or something like that, right? Like, um, and so we just kind of followed my dad. So when I was a little fella, we moved to Canada. I was a bit older and moved to the States. And then I moved around in the States a fair bit. So ended up in Miami for my last few years. And then was going to join the military over in the US, but they had a direct recruitment scheme to special forces in Australia. A friend of mine who was in the SAS called up and said, come over here instead. So I did that instead, came here, was in special operations for about ne just nearly seven years, I would say, and then got out and then became a personal trainer. And then from there, like kind of fell into like the getting mentored space, really enjoyed that, learning off people. And then pretty much always ended up business partnering at the end of the day with my mentor. That's kind of always what ended up happening. And then getting into the sales gig because like I was terrible at it, but they kind of threw me into a position where I had to kind of open gyms. And so I enjoyed eating. I like having roofs over my head at night. So I was like, well, I guess this is the thing that I have to get good at. And so I just did what I needed to do to get good at that. And then from there, that kind of evolved 
over the years into being something that I really loved and enjoyed. Ended up not liking the fitness side of things anymore, but loving the business and sales side. And then when I decided to exit from that business because of a unimportant stuff in the background, I was like, well, this is what I enjoy doing. So I just started cold calling gyms and being like, do you want someone to do your sales for you? And they were like, yep. And I was like, sweet. So I became a kind of gun for hire for gyms. And then it mm. kind of grew and grew and grew and became what it is today. Wow. Okay. So, so taking that back for a second, I love the word, I love that you use the word boffin as well. I don't know if I thought that was an English phrase um, and not too yeah. know what that means. Um, so your, your dad's obviously an inventor. He's, he's creating these whatever weird and wacky things is, is what I imagine um, inventors. He's got to sell those ideas to people that want to then take it to the market or help him take it. So is that where the sales fundamentals come from? Do you think? Well, it's funny, right? My dad was a business person as well. So he would invent things and then he would also go in, he would be paid to invent something and then go in and help with the implementation and the growth. And he was kind of an interesting mm. cat. Um, yeah. And then, so my dad, who's also a venture capitalist, he kind of did both. And then, so um, whenever I wanted to do anything as a child, my dad would make me do a business plan. So I was like, hey, I want to buy a car. And he was like, whack it up, buddy. Present yeah. Oh. Like, why, why should I buy you a car? And then like, whenever I got a job, he would sit me down and he would make me dissect the business and figure out what the profit margins, supply chains, like, what are they paying staff? What, can, what assumptions can we make? And how is that business operating? And then like, from there, he, he would just teach me. So I worked at internet cafes, I worked at ice cream parlors, I did delivery stuff. And from age about the 15, 16, I had a job all the time. And he would just kind of make me go through that. And so I always had kind of a love of business um, and I had a hate of sales. I didn't like doing it at all. I thought it was really sleazy and scummy until I kind of figured out how to do it the right way. And then I realized how transformative and powerful it could actually be. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and I, I think, you know, my journey, most of our listeners do as well. So I won't go yeah. too far into that. But um, I want I want to figure out some of the lessons along the way. 11 different sc schools, right? That's going to expose you to many different personalities and and people of different yeah. cultures um has that played a part do you think looking back retrospectively it made me a really good uh communicator and very comfortable talking to people i don't know because like i was changing schools at very formative times now uh, which is not something i'd recommend <laughs> yeah, yeah. but like in retrospect it, it, there's goods and bads do you know what i mean to both um but like, you know, when I was 16, I changed schools. That's a rough age to change yeah. schools. You know, everyone's fairly established. And then I went from a very, very generic, you know, like a Midwestern type area to Miami, right? I was one of four white kids in my school, <laughs> yeah, wow. right? Um, and it was just a totally culture shock, yeah. totally different. And I had to kind of come into that. But because I'd done it before, I kind of knew what to do and how to approach things. And I was pretty okay with who I was at that point. And so I was kind of okay if some liked me and some didn't. So I think like go, chopping and changing all the time, I became really good at being the new guy. And so like that sort of sharpened my sense of humor, um, sharpened my wit as it were, uh, which made me kind of tough to tangle with when it comes to debates and, you know, going tit for tit when it comes to, you know, insults and stuff, which the army honed even further. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, from there, it just became comfortable chatting with people. Which I think is a, and I wasn't scared of people not wanting to chat to me. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then, so you touched on the the, the military there as well. Um, is it really um, naive to say, well, obviously that's going to build your re resilience, going to give you a thick skin and perspective, or, or, or is there certain aspects of it where you can pinpoint the things you were trained that have now set you up for the the business that you run? I think that there's there's goods and bads, right? So I think like, especially in like the special operations community, like which I was in, um, there's, you would think that a lot of people would come out of that, like go hung, you know, ah, let's go, let's go dominate the business world. And there is a percentage of people that do that. There's also a large percentage of people which think because you've done something that's cool in the past, that people should give you a pass now. Mm. And so like, you know, there's like that identity, I guess people who have like prestigious degrees would be similar. I'm a Yale graduate. You should, it's like, I don't care, mate. Like, yeah. what, like, what can you do for me right now? Right. I don't particularly care what you've done in the past. Like 
let's just treat everybody equally. And so I think there's a pro and a con. I think I had to get the chip off my shoulder. That was a real thing that I had to do because my identity was very wrapped up in being in this hyper elite unit. And I was in, in snipers in the elite unit. So I was like in the elite of the elite of the elite. And there's a massive arrogance that came along with that, which was hard not to get. Mm. And I managed not to get it too bad. But then as I left, I kind of realized, like I thought that people should want to do things with me or want to give me a job because of the extremely difficult things I've done, which just isn't the case. And so I had to kind of relearn that and then take some of the tools that I did learn and then figure out how to channel them because it's not that obvious how you yeah. go. Cause the day-to-day -day skills, like I was a sniper, like my entire twenties, I spent learning how to shoot people. And that's not a particularly valuable skill in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just not. And so like, you know, it's not a great thing to put on a resume, demolitions expert, you know, like who cares? Um, and so for me, it became like, well, how do I take the elements that got me to a position where I could be in an elite unit? And then how do I kind of steer those into something that's productive now? Because it can go either way. The difference between a special forces operator and a bikey is good parents, <laughs> yeah. right? That's it. And so you can zig or zag with the motivations that you have. And I was lucky to have really good parents and a great upbringing. And so like I put that motivation to something positive. And then when I got out, it took me a couple of years to figure out how I do that. I just felt like I was running in place all the time. and Didn't really know where to do it until I kind of figured out what I wanted. And then once I figured out what I wanted, then I kind of went for it. And I'm willing to work very, very hard. And, and so, and that's a trait that I share with a lot of guys from my community. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that there's almost a metaphor in there, isn't there? Like in sales, people do get to a certain level and they almost feel that the prospect or the person they're speaking to should know who they are and should know what skill set they have and it should just be a walkover and then they don't go through the actual process of asking the right questions at the right time in the yeah. right time so on and so forth like so i mean that might be a nice little segue into the sales aspect like are you find do you find that as you're training these these sales people like how, how do you keep them grounded how do you make sure that we don't get caught up in that trap of i've been doing this for 10 years i'm gonna cut corners yeah it's a big one right like and so for me i'm a huge fan of process like, I, I don't particularly, it sounds bad. I don't care what happens at the end of the call. If they buy, they buy. If they don't, they don't. Like, that's totally fine by me, either direction. Like, that's a choice that they've made. I don't pretend to be able to change people's minds or manipulate their decision-making, right? Like, they will control what happens. I can guide them, but I can't make them do stuff, right? Yeah. And so, like, I just focus on doing my process. And I do my process every time in a way that I know is really efficient. And then from there, that has a very predictable outcome, right? And it's like, if I don't get somebody, but I did my process, fully happy with that, mm. right? And so what I try and teach people is like, just work on your process, get good at like doing the basics. Like, let's just do that, drill that in. Um, I work on like deflections to get back to the process. So it's like, if someone's throwing you curveballs, this is how we get them back and we work on that. And then it's like, or how do we make it so that our process, so we can start understanding the doors that we're opening and shutting as we take them through. And then we make sure we open and shut the correct doors. And then we make sure that when we comes to objection handling at the end, we've done all the work to be able to handle them seamlessly and without being combative. Yeah. You know, which I think is really key. So yeah. I think most salespeople, I'm, I'm lucky I'm in a position where I can speak from a lot of authority in the realm that I'm in, which is like mainly around that coaching and consulting space. Like I made a hundred grand a month consistently in pure commissions as a commission only sales rep, which not many people can say they've done and I could back it up and they know that I know what I'm talking about. So I'm like, Hey, this is my experience. If you want to emulate it, you need to do it this way. Yeah. I'm not perfect, but this is how I did it. Yeah. You know? Um, so generally speaking, it's not really too much of a problem until they start making a ton of money and then they know everything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a pattern, right? You can, you can, and you can see it coming as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an ex engineer of, of eight years, so I'm, I'm process orientated, and I think that's why that this partnership is coming together because I can see we're on the same page with that. I'm a big fan of people, process, performance, and 
get get yeah. the right people, put them in the right process, and and the performance will follow. But many businesses try to do it the other way around. It's just all about KPIs and and having a preconceived idea about where this phone call or where this interaction is going to go, instead of actually. I know you say you don't care, but the, just emotionally detaching from the outcome. Like yeah, um, like I want them to buy, but yes, yes. if they don't, it's like okay. I'm not going to be angry about it <laughs> like, or punch a wall or get upset. I'm like, man, like it's fine. And I think that's for like really understanding your process and being really confident that what you're doing is the right way of doing things, which is why it's so essential. You reach out to someone like you and you're like, Hey man, like that's a proven process. If I just do that process now, that process is going to work this amount of time at the beginning. But if I stick to it, it will get better and better and better and better because I'll understand it more. You know, and then you can start to add your own flair and all that kind of stuff right to it. But it's like, it really is like, it's so process driven. If you listen to my calls, or I'm sure your calls or anyone who's like, you know, knows what they're doing, they're fairly similar, yeah. a little bit boring, right? <laughs> and it's like, this is so, it, man. So this talk to just... talk to me about that. Talk to me about the boring side of things. Cause you're, um, what did you, how did you phrase it? No charisma, no authority. Um, yeah, that's your learning thing. how to sell without charisma or authority. <laughs> that goes against everything I've ever read, I ever got taught around like over enthusiasm and, and being like transferring enthusiasm to the to the buyer and blah, blah, blah. So give us your take on that. Yeah, well, like, because like what I sell predominantly or you, not so much right now, but what, I, what I've come up selling is other people's stuff. Yeah. So I can't, I don't have any authority. Right. For example, like one of the first high ticket coaching gigs that I had was selling business coaching to builders. Now, I know nothing about building businesses, nor do I plan on knowing anything about them. Right. And I also know nothing about digital marketing, all this kind of stuff. Like, I don't know, I can't help these people. So, like, if I'm getting asked questions or I'm trying to speak from authority and be like, no, what you need to do is fix your recruitment process. And that's going to, it's like, I don't know any of that. So, if I do, I'm just kind of talking out of my ass, to be honest. So like what I need to do is take someone through a process that doesn't involve authority. Now I can lead them. That's different, but I'm not speaking from a state of authority to where I know better than them. Right. And I don't require charisma because the guy on camera, who's the one getting the leads in that's charismatic. That's an X factor. That's something that someone has or they don't, you can't teach charisma. So why would I ever want a process that I can't teach somebody? Mm. it's non-replicatable. So the way that I teach sales is very, very similar to the way that you teach sales. The way that I do sales is very similar to yours is like, let's just have a process that's question-based that asks people the correct questions. We learn how to probe, clarify on what they want. And we lead them through a conversation that discovers what they want, why they want it, what they need to get there, what happens if they don't get there and create some urgency and help them move forward. Right? Like that's it. If I have to rely, it's really funny, like a lot of business owners, you know, you probably did this before, they'll come up and then everyone emulates the guy at the top, the guy who made it like, mm. and that's an unreplicatable process because yeah. that person has an authority that you that is non translatable. Yeah. And if you try and sell in that way, like, there's maybe one guy that will be able to copy it. And that guy's going to become a problem. Because mm. you're going to create a mini me who's then going to branch out and try and destroy you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like that's the most likely. So, um, I did it. I yeah. Did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah. I, well, I, I fell into the trap uh, to be fair. Like we're not, not breaking away, but I fell into the trap of trying to replicate my old sales manager. Um, and the style just, it wasn't me. Um, and there, and I know you're an advocate for this is that there are, there's many, you, you teach many different styles. There's lots of different ways to sell. Um, but, um, I was trying to be someone that I wasn't uh, and, and, and that meant that I wasn't following a process. I was trying to be somebody else. Um, and, the, yeah. and the language, it didn't come across authentic. Um, and I was just losing people left, right and center. Yeah. I find that all the time. It's like, you got to take the process. Then you got to kind of learn how to, you know, learn that process, that way of doing it. Don't think it's one of the biggest sales tips that I can tell people is don't emulate what people do emulate how they think. Like, so if I'm trying to understand how you sell and I'm like, okay, how does Ryan do it? I will sit down with an example of you selling and I'll go, what was going through your head when you asked X, Y, and Z? Yeah. And so when I coach people, that's what I do. Cause it's kind of like, you can have great salespeople or great um, doers, 
And then you go, like, if you had Roger Federer, you're like, why did you hit a forehand at that time against that guy in that corner? And he might go, because it was the right thing to do. And you're like, yeah, but why? And just, mm. mate, just hit it over there. It's right. But it's like, okay, but I'm not you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not Roger Federer. Can you break down the thought process so I can identify that situation in the future and then change my thought process to match the correct? And so it's like, you get someone who's better than you. And if you can break down why they're doing what they're doing and then ask very inquisitive questions, one of the things I get people to do is when they're first learning is I'll go, get someone who's got nothing to do with sales, have them listen to your call with you and then get them just to ask every question that pops in their head. Yeah, why? Right? Just be like, why'd you say that? Why'd you say that like that, with that inflection? Like, well, I was trying to set this up and then mm. you'll realize you're doing stuff that's good and you'll realize you're doing stuff that's bad. Yeah. But you'll have the realization. So then instead of the sales just happening to you, you're like an active participant and you're the one playing chess. Mm. And then you're doing all the pieces and moving all the pieces actively. And then when you're an active participant in the conversation, you're the one leading it, even if it doesn't seem like you are, then you're going to dictate the outcome more likely than not, mm. instead of just being reactive. And so that's kind of like... Um, that's like the real nitty gritty that I think and when people become really, really good at sales is that they just, they figure out the thought process of someone who's really good and then they can start to dissect their own and then they can start to like articulate that. And the better you can articulate it, the better you can think of it in your own head, the more control you have over a call. Yeah, that, I mean, don't, don't emulate what I do, emulate what I think. Yeah, I love that. That really that really stands out for me there. And is that is that an element of what you love about coaching then? Um, like she, knowing that you can bring anybody from any background, with very little to zero sales experience, and you can take them through a process and, and, and help them grow? Like, is, it, is there more to it? Is it obviously the financial side of things is nice, but what's, what's the key? Yeah, I mean, coaching? like most of my coaching is my internal team these days. Yes. You know what I mean? Because we do a lot of done for you, right? So... The people who we recruit, I recruit young guys and girls who are hungry. That's it. Like they don't need sales experience. I'm a true believer that sales is not a God-given gift. It is a process. Yeah. And so it's like, I can teach you that process. Now, not everyone's going to be good at it. That's just the way it works. But we can make enough people good enough at it to be successful. How, how long and do then, we need, Matt? How long do we need to, to judge whether we're going to get it or not? Um, to be honest, like I feel like I can tell relatively quickly, um, just by giving them the process and then listening to their calls, I can tell if they're asking the right question. So if I understand their thought process, if I go, okay, the execution was poor, but they're on the right track when it comes to thought process, I'm like, yeah, you've got it. I can six months, you're good to go. Yeah. But if I listen and I go, oh, I got no idea why he said that. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know where that's going. I can't, I can't figure it out. And I ask them and they don't know. I have to go, okay, we need to back right up. Let's try and fix this. But this is going to take twice as long. Mm. You know, and then it's like, how long are you willing to stay in the saddle? Like, if you're willing to give it 12 months, sweet man, so am I. Right? If you're not, that's cool too. Maybe there's another role for you. Mm. Right. And so I think that, like I had a, I had a person who was great culture fit, phenomenal, lovely person. And I just like, Hey man, I just got to say, this just isn't the game for you, but I really want you to be part of the organization. Yeah. So I just created a role for them that I thought was really good and they're really happy. Yeah. But I was like, you're not going to make money doing this. Yeah. Our, our um, operations manager was in sales. It was, uh, it was a great, a great opener. Um, it was a great, lead generator but it wasn't going to fulfill potential shuffled him and just positively transitioned him into a new role and he's really found his element so yeah i i believe yeah and that's and that's that's great you know but like we, we've taken dudes from zero to mid six figures in eight months um especially our internal team because they have a lot of opportunity yeah. um but also I, i'm a big believer in like the environment that you're in plays a huge role like i've gone into companies where their top closer is earning twenty five thousand a month and i'm like man i would have expected four times that out of this company and then all of a sudden like i'll put one of my guys in as like a pace setter yeah, yeah. everybody comes up it's like the four minute mile yeah, yeah. It used to be, a, you know, now you got, now you got, you know, high school girls running it as a warm up. So, <laughs> you know, it's just like once somebody does it, it's done. 
And so there's a pace setting. And I think a lot of companies don't have good pace setters, which is a real problem. Mm. And, and, and I guess during that process as well, people will, will go the other way and deselect themselves out of it. I imagine that some people are just like this. I'm not going to be able to do that. So you, you've got, correct me if I'm wrong again, what, 60 plus salespeople globally? Uh, I think we did the manning today, 68, yeah. Okay, so, um, but but obviously a lot of remote work, um, mm -hmm. not everybody in the office down there in Sydney. Um, talk to me about how you keep in that, that culture, if we if we use that word, um, and keeping everybody motiv motivated 24, 7, 365. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Like, it's definitely not me. Like, I, I play a role as the figurehead. Uh, James, my business partner, who you've met, yep. is phenomenal at that stuff. That's like his secret power. Also, I'm a huge believer in like, I'd rather have a smaller piece of a giant pie than a giant piece of a small pie. And so like, I went out and like, basically like poached as best <laughs> as best what I can. Yeah, yeah. This sort of came to me, it's not really poaching, but like I was, I really wanted very, very strong management talent. And I've got like five people who are absolute savages. A lot of ex special forces, a lot of ex police, like riot police, cops, all that kind of stuff who are extraordinarily loyal to me extraordinarily loyal to the company. I pay them really well with profit shares and all that kind of stuff. And then like they have very, very clear and defined roles. And we have a very clear management structure with, we have an alpha Bravo Charlie, right? So Charlie are our new guys are the lowest, right? There are guys who are setting, calling, outreach, DM stuff. We have Bravos who are guys that have been promoted from Charlie to alpha. They're mentoring the Charlies right, as well, on how to replace them, and then they're closing lower ticket deals. And then we have the alphas who mentor the bravos, right, and they're guys who are just closing deals, and they're also helping to run accounts. Then we have those managers that mentor the alphas. Mm -hmm. I also just hired a full-time career development manager who's doing a 15 to 30-minute call with every single staff member every single month, holding them accountable to hitting their goals. Yeah, nice. And then we have, like, a couple of guys, like, probably seven or eight guys, that are like that are all alphas and all the alphas are super financially successful like 40k plus a month in commissions so like everyone knows it's possible right and so everyone's kind of trying to compete in a positive way to get up to the level where they can do that and as more people get up i expand more people get up, I expand so I can expand the opportunities as, as we go in line with the amount of talent that we have. And I try and internally promote. And so like it's, and we have very, very clear ethics and mission and business and values. We have a thing called scope, right? Which everybody knows, everyone can recite it, and all, all that kind of good stuff. And so, and then I also like for someone one year in the company, I buy them a watch. I bought like 12, $10,000 plus watches last year. Right. And so, and then I've just, uh, we're just organizing a retreat in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere for all of our guys to be able to go into those retreats. And I've hired people and fitness and sales trainers. I also pay for a fitness coach to train all of my stuff. Mm. Um, so it's an online fitness coach. His name is James Kant. He's phenomenal. I think you know, you know, James. I, I, I do know James. Yeah. Yeah. We, we pay him to train our entire stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Right. So like we do a lot of things like that because we're not remote because we are remote. We kind of have to go above and beyond. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. To hold people. But if I had a look at that and if I had everyone in Sydney and I had a giant office, yeah. I'd probably spend more in that giant office than what I would just providing all these like X factors and bonuses and this yeah. and this and this to make people really want to be involved in the company long-term. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, like that, all those, all those tiny one percenters, like they, they don't go unnoticed. Right. Um, obviously it doesn't mean you have a hundred percent retention, I'm sure of, of staff and I'm sure no. there's, there's, there's turnover, but the intent, the intent is right. Um, I want to get in sales for a second. I want to just, just close the loop yeah. on perspective. Um, cause I know you've got a couple of, I want to try and get some practical sales tips in here as well. You've got yeah. a couple of language patterns around helping people put things into perspective, um, oh, yeah. or, or, or asking them, if they'd be open to looking at things in a, in a, a different perspective, do you mind, do you mind sharing a couple of those and, and then also why you do it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I think like, I like, I like word tracks and, and kind of uh, systems, big systems fan. I think like objection handling is a system. I've, I've, I've nailed that system. Like I'm pretty, pretty confident with it. Um, and so like, I, but I also have a big belief that people 
like make decisions that either take them towards or away from their goal. That's it. Those are, it's very binary when it comes to that. And so like, um, like I, I also think like one of the most powerful and freeing things that I kind of realized in my life was that everything is my fault. If everything is my fault, then I can solve everything and it's all on me. And like, I'd rather have it be on me than anybody else. Mm. Right. And so like, whether it's for COVID or like as a young kid, I was told I was overweight because of my genetics. <coughs> Terrible thing. Don't ever tell anybody that because then when a problem becomes bigger than yourself, you don't try and fix it. Yeah. Once I realized that it was my fault, it was just my decision-making process. I just changed my decision-making process and then I had a better outcome. And so like, I think it's the same things in business. Like if you're in a position right now, you're not particularly happy with your outcomes. It is simply a product of your decision-making process. So if you're open to looking at things from a different perspective, making decisions in a different way, then you're now in the ability to be able to get a different outcome. Right. And so that is something that I lay as a foundation hmm. throughout a lot of the sale. Where, where are you saying that, Matt? How, how early is it? Or, oh no. uh, well, it depends on the sale, but a lot of the time we'll anchor it very early in what I call as a hook. Right. So let's say I'm selling sales coaching. I'll do a congruency framework. Right. So I'll be like, hey, I love working with salespeople because salespeople have that kind of like congruency of speech and action. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to get people to consistently take action on their goals, then usually salespeople consistently take action on their goals, right? So it's always a really productive and fun yeah. conversation. I like it. Then at, then at the end, I can anchor that throughout the call as well. I can anchor the word congruency. And then at the end, if someone gives me an objection, I can, I can kind of say, well, you know, that kind of makes sense because we all make decisions based on our perspective, right? Yes, but the problem is if we're always making decisions based off where we are, then we're never going to, be congruent enough to kind of be where we want to be. Does that, does that make sense? And they go, yes, it's a very easy thing to agree with. And then, so I'll go through a series of word tracks. One of them is like, so Ryan, like, you know, scale of one to 10, kind of cheesy question, but I guess like, how happy are you with, with where you're at with X, Y, and Z right now? Uh, yes. Now seven. you're going to give me, yeah. yeah, seven. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Seven's always a good one. Right. Yeah. So I go, okay, man, like if you're a seven, what does a 10 look like? Uh, and yep. a 10 would be what we've future paced out before, which would be a big gap. If I haven't done that, I haven't done my job, right? So then I go, okay, man, like, not like a math wizard, hmm. but that's a pretty big gap. So if you were a four, like, would, would you be dead? It's kind of a, it's a big gap, you know what I mean? So like, no ego, no nothing, man. Like, if I'm here to help, if I can, I can, if I can, I can't, but where, where are you really? And then they always go, I'm a four. Four is always the number. So you're doing right? that, whatever they said first time around, you, you're asking that secondary question. Where are you? Yeah, so if they say a seven, I'll build the gap between seven and 10, which is going to be big, which yep. is too big, right? So now they're not looking at where they are like realistically. So I'll kind of in a very soft way go, come on, man, that's a huge gap. If that's the gap between seven and 10, between four and seven, you're dead. Yeah, there yeah. is no one, right? It's huge, right? So where, where are we actually at? If we just remove the ego, the everything, like where are we at? And they'll go, I'm more of a four. And I'll go, so that that decision-making process, man, that got you to become a four, like how, how much longer do you allow that to dictate your life and your results moving forward? And they always go, I don't, mm. <laughs> right? And then, so that's like a really strong place for me to then to do a little bit of a push away, right? So I like to work with human behavior. So if I know that, like, if I have an idea, that's good, that's a good idea. I'm not close. Yes, I don't want to be there anymore. I push them back a little bit. It's like, hey, we like you don't have to, man. No one's gonna make you like there's I'm sure there's a lot of new year, new me stories where the people are really successful. And one of the things I'll do is I go, you know, Everest, the summit is hard to get to brother. And like, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made along the way to get to the summit. But hey, man, Base camp's pretty cool too. So what are we doing, bro? Do you want to go to base camp or do you want to actually get to the summit? I want to get to the summit. All right. So what do we need to do to put ourselves in a position where you can actually get there? And then like I take the sale away from buying something to doing something. Mm -hmm. And that doing is not guaranteeing results. I'm not saying what do you need to do to make sure you make 50K a month commissions. I'm not saying that because I can't, like they might never get there. 
But as long as they're constantly making decisions in a manner that puts them in a position to where they can, that's all you can do. Mm. And if you make that decision enough times, chances are you'll be okay. You know, because I'm never going to lie to somebody in a sale ever. I'm never going to tell them they can do something that is guaranteed. The only thing that's guaranteed is death and taxes. That's it, right? And so I just want them to make a decision that puts them in the best possible position to be able to achieve the outcome, right? And so I have a lot of word tracks around that particular same thing, you know, like analogies that sort of have a look at decision-making and why certain decisions are made. Because I want that person, like the great thing about stories and analogies is people place themselves as a protagonist all the time. So I can tell a story about a third party, they are immediately placed themselves as the main character. Mm. And so like, I can very softly, I can be very rough on them without ever talking about them. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so like attack, and like attack and confess model is similar. Like if someone is in a comfortable mode, a lot of the time people who find it hard to sell people who are like in a state of comfort, like they're doing fairly well. You know, guy's pretty successful. He's top five in his company, yada, yada, yada. And so like finding a way to get those people to become uncomfortable is key. So like I'll use an attack and confess model once I hear them say the word comfortable or I know where they are. I go, so it sounds like you're comfortable. Yeah. And I go, man, like for me, I know comfort is tough, man. Like, what do you mean? It's like, well, I'm in a position where I'm fairly comfortable. Like I know that things are going fairly well, but like I have aspirational dreams you know i want to i want to get places like i have goals that i want to hit and i know that comfort is like for me is like a breeding ground of mediocrity you know it's like it's it's hard to get off the couch when you're all snuggled up and you get a little hot chocolate but if somebody lights the house on fire like you're gone because hmm. you're uncomfortable and so and then I can put some frames like i have some sort of darker frames so i can go over one of them if you want <laughs> there's like um no, so like good. Yeah, so like, so I, I have things in my life that I do to intentionally make myself uncomfortable. Do you want me to kind of take you through what I do? Maybe they'll help you. I have a, I have a poster in my office that has 4,000 dots on it. Do you know what the 4,000 dots represent? Are they the weeks in year? Is that the... Yeah, it's how many weeks the average human being is given in, right? So I was one dot for every week. And uh, every single Monday morning, I go to that toaster right there and I cross off one of the dots. My wife hates it. Right, because it's pretty morbid, right? Crossing off a week of life. I actually but get this I, to my team once, by the way, Matt, and uh, they, they said it was the most um, demotivating motivational exercise they've ever done. So it's quite scary. Yeah. Right? It's confronting. It is, I think, for the right person. But like for me, it's intentional discomfort. Yes. And so what I do is I take five minutes to reflect: Did I do everything over the last seven days to put myself in a position to where I can succeed on X and Y and Z? Right. And then, so I can then carry that forward and go, so how many, once I kind of go through some more word tracks and I can establish that as the things like how many, how many more dots do you want to cross off before you actually start doing something about this, man? And then I'll make them give me a number. Is it five? Is it seven more? Hmm. 15? How many more dots are you going to walk up there on a Monday morning and cross off before but you actually start doing something about this? For those people that are listening right now that are going, I could never say that to anybody, explain the intentional discomfort. Why is that important to do to, to, to get somebody to move to action? It's because like they're in a state of comfort, which is stopping them. So they like in order to achieve big things, you need to do big things, right? And so if you have a goal that you're out there and if you're sitting there and it's like you just haven't been bothered, like the people who are hardest to get to lose weight are either people who have accepted the pain of being overweight or they have like five pounds to lose right? Because they've either accepted it and that's terrible or they're just like, oh, it's not that bad, right? But it's like, if you actually want it, then like create discomfort in your own life that forces you to do it. And so it's about, it's a motivational thing. People run away from things far faster than they run towards things. Yes, yeah. If I take Usain Bolt, put him on a hundred meter line and put all the fame, money, and women he could ever want, the faster he runs, the more he gets. If I release a lion behind him, he's going to run faster. It's just the way human beings work. Yeah. And so like when you're looking at your goals, you need to have a carrot and a stick because if you don't somewhat catastrophize never achieving your ultimate goal, then you're never running as hard as you possibly can. And so like a lot of people, when they come into a sales environment, they have a significant problem 
that they're not doing anything about. And the reason why they're not doing anything about it is because they've never seriously considered what happens when they succeed and not just what happens like, oh, it'd be great to make more money. Okay, how much more money? What would you do with it? Where would you go on the holiday? What would you do? What kind of, fun? like, like I'm talking specifics because when you have a specific goal, it's far more powerful. Mm. Like if you have a house that you drive past every week and you want to buy that house, that's a powerful vision. If you just want to buy a new house, nothing detached to it because you can't picture yourself walking through the door with your wife and setting up your kid's room. And it's all those little th detailed things that really solidify something as real. And then once I can solidify it as real, I take that away from them and go, what happens if you're never in a position to be able to achieve that? Mm. Right. And it's like, oh shit, for the first time in my life, I'm considering what happens if I fail, like genuinely fail. And I have always considered what happens when I fail because my most formative years of life were spent trying not to die. <laughs> right. And so failure was catastrophic to me. Because it was like, man, if I'm not really good at this, I would die. That would suck. Sucks less for me than it does for other people, to be perfectly honest. But like, I don't want to leave myself or my family or my friends in a position to where they have to put themselves at risk to help me. And yeah. so like, I need to get really good at this. And so like, I was like, man, if I don't, there are significant consequences. And I've taken that like kind of catastrophic <laughs> belief to all parts of my life. And that's why like, I, I kind of have been able to spread kind of like a virus so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite pertinent. Um, man, I've got last two questions before we wrap up. Um, the one of them is we're talking, we're talking about goals right there. Um, what, what, what is yours? What's, what's the North star for Matt? What, what, what where, where are we going with this? Uh, North star for me is, is really like, there's a couple things. First of all, like, um, I want to create like the biggest done for you sales agency. I want to have 50 clients, right? And I want to have 200 sales guys, right? Um, and then from there, I'm going to take that and I'm going to own about 35 different businesses, right? That's kind of the plan. Um, uh, own equity stakes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, from there, I have a couple of like charities that I want to start to do with helping guys transition out of the military. A lot of them are kind of like financial hostages to the military. Um, Australian military is paid quite well. So, but they, they want to leave, but they can't. And that's not a good place to be if you want to leave, yeah. right? So creating some transition programs. And then from there, like really it's about like all the guys in my organization, like I need all of them to hit their financial goals. So right now we're in a process of like cataloging all of their goals and putting in pathways. And I want to be able to just create successful people. That's really what it's Love all that. about. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Um, Love yeah. that. And the last one is... Uh, I've got two young boys, um, two and a half and nine months. I know you've got a couple of kids as well. Um, how yeah. often do they paint your nails, mate? Because I've mate, seen very, that a few very times often. on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my daughter pretty much every night comes and goes, paint nails, paint nails. She's two and a half. And I'm like, yeah, all right, here you go. She does my eyelashes as well. She does everything. She's fake makeup, puts it on me. I was like, well, who am I to say no? Well, you've had <laughs> absolutely no choice to be fair. Uh, and, I, and I love that. I, lo I love the realness yeah. behind that as well and, and putting it out there. And, and I talk to, I talk a lot about personal brand, being a real human being, um, what's and all being vulnerable. And I think that plays to your sales ability, but uh, as, of just being a real human being. Um, yeah. And, and you can just, go to salesniper.net. You can download one of my sales calls right now for free. Awesome. Well, so I was going to ask that. So we're, we're yeah. into salesniper.net. Yeah. It's got to the free resources section how to generate referrals, all the stuff, all my internal processes that my guys take for the most part, the ones that are like easily applicable without heaps yeah. of coaching, we give away for free um, because like they work for me. So hopefully they work for you. Uh, okay. So we're not really sales coaches. I help people with sales. I coach a lot of my own guys. Uh, if you want sales coaching, go to Ryan. <laughs> He's better than me at it. Um, but yeah, so yeah, like go on there. You can have a look at us. We have a podcast because coffee is for closers which is like a half rant podcast, I suppose, about, about different yes. things that we come up with. Um, and then I got a YouTube channel called Matthew Ryder as well. So like I'm out there as much as you could possibly be, um, warts and all. So failures, wins, all kinds of stuff. Love it, mate. Thank you very much for your time. I do really appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone took a lot of value from today. Cheers, mate. No, thank you so much. Man.